Hallelujah. Are we ready to take this ride? Are we ready? Amen. Today we're going to be talking about faith to the end. Faith to the end. That's what we are going to be sharing. Faith to the end. It is so good to think that we have the privilege or the opportunity to share God's word. To share God's word. Imagine that. You know there are people out there who are not Christians. They're not born again Christian, but they believe in some sort of God. And they believe that the God that they believe is God. So it is such a privilege for us to know that the one true God that we call God is the one true God. Hallelujah. Imagine how sad it is to commit your whole life to a certain cause and then to realize that that cause was a sham. But to realize that you've given your whole life to a cause and to actually realize that this cause is totally worth it. Our faith is worth it. Our belief in Jesus Christ is worth it. One of my friends likes to say, uh, one of my friends likes to say that we have a sure thing in Christ. Hallelujah. Don't you turn to your neighbor, tell them you have a sure thing in Christ. Come on, don't be afraid to turn to your neighbor, tell them you have a sure thing in Christ. A sure thing, for sure, for sure, sure thing in Christ. We're heading over to the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 3. And I pray that as we listen to God's word, we allow God's word to come to us unchained. It's like releasing a leopard in a goat pen. It will go in there and do the thing. Whether you have called it fluffy or you have called it a cute little pet name, a leopard is a leopard. When it goes where the goats are, it will do the thing that leopards do. And the word of God is living and active, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, power or sharper than any two-edged sword. And so as we release the word of God today in this place, we pray that it will go into the different chambers of your life, that it will light up what needs to be lit up in the areas of darkness, that the word of God will heal what needs to be healed. It will break down and completely destroy beyond recognition what needs to be destroyed in the different chambers of our hearts, that the word of God will go in like a mighty wind and pull down walls in the name of Jesus. It will go forth like a mighty fire and it will scorch completely to the ground every structure that lifts itself against the knowledge of Jesus Christ. As the word of God comes forth, I pray that it shall restore, it shall bring order to places that order is needed in our lives, and not only to our lives, but to our nation, and everywhere else that the word of God will reach today, in the different places that it is being preached, to the praise and to the glory of the name of Jesus. Amen. Are you ready? Amen. Galatians chapter 3 verse 1, and we say, we read it, it says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was actually in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Paul, as he's speaking to the Galatians, is using very blunt language. He's speaking to them plainly. And he has every right to do that because he has seen them come to the faith. This gospel has been preached to them. They have been established. And so in just a little bit, after leaving and having to write a letter to encourage them or to speak to them, the news reaching him, a news that they are now going back to that old place. Having known the truth, they are leaving that and mixing it with other things. They are going back, at the time the issue was going back to the law. They are believing that, going back to believing that salvation is through works, through the law, and not by faith. And so he writes to them this candid letter and saying to them, Oh, you foolish Galatians. It's important to note, however, that the word he's using here for foolish is not the same one um, to mean mental deficiency. Like somebody who cannot comprehend things or somebody who cannot make decisions. Somebody who is just a fool. Actually, the, um, the, 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 the word for it would be yeah, mental deficiency. That is not what he's using. Uh, it's not the same as what Jesus was using in Matthew chapter 7 and 26 when he's speaking and giving um, a, a, this story about a foolish man or a fool 
built his house upon the sand. And the rains came and the winds blew and the house on the sand fell flat. That's not the foolish. Now, that foolish man is somebody who just cannot comprehend. Somebody who has a mental deficiency. Because if you go and put up a house right at the beach and do not go deep until you find some rock so that you can establish it, then truly, you're foolish. Because that house is going to fall flat if you build it on the sand. If the foundation is not sure, the house is going to come apart. So if you do that, if you build on a foundation that is not sure or solid, then you know that um, there is some moral defici- there is some mental sorry, deficiency in some place. It's also not the same word foolish that uh, Jesus is using again when he's giving the parable of um, the ten virgins. In Matthew, again, chapter 25 from verse 1, it's not the same one. When he's saying that there were five, there were, there were five um, wise ones and there were five foolish ones. The foolish ones forgot to carry extra um, oil for their lamps. Now, that foolish one is just ill that we're talking about. It's a mental deficiency because, I mean, you should sit and know, if you're going to wait for someone, I need to carry some extra oil for my fuel. If you're going for a long journey, for instance, and you know you're going to go inside into the interior and there are no petrol stations or gas stations, you, you would be wise to fill up your tank with fuel and maybe to carry an extra tank to bring you back until a place you can fuel again. If you don't do that, then there is some deficiency somewhere. Now, that is not what, uh, what Jesus is talking about. Is th- that foolishness that he's talking about in those two instances is a foolishness for that one. Yo, you just cannot... The foolishness he's talking about that Paul is using here, the word for foolishness that Paul is using here, is different, which has the idea of someone who can think but fails to use their power of perception. They, they know the truth, but they fail to use it. They know what is right to do, but they do not do it. They understand the correct thing. They know the way, but they refuse to take it. You know that you can find help, but you refuse to ask for it. That is a different kind of, kind, kind of foolishness. And if you ask me if I were to choose between the two, I would rather the mental deficiency. Because at least then, you are already at your wit's end. You don't know what to do. You are failing to do the right thing because you truly don't know what to do or how to do the right thing. The other kind of foolishness that Paul is talking about is a special kind of foolishness. Indeed, it's a foolishness that you know what is the right thing to do, but for some reason you don't just want to use it. So he says to them, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, which indeed you knew, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? He doesn't mean that they were there when Jesus was being crucified. No, he means that the truth of the gospel has been revealed to them just like it has been revealed to you and to I, or to you and to me, in this place. Sunday after Sunday, we come and we hear about the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, who is reigning, seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and for me, who has promised the Holy Spirit that has already been released, that is going to and fro, doing the great work of comforting and helping and supporting and counseling and all those things that the Holy Spirit does. We know that help is available, but when we refuse to use it, we are no different from the foolish Galatians. Come on, buona sifiwe. So Paul is speaking to them and he's telling them, you guys know the truth. Jesus has already been revealed to you. You know that there is help that is available. You know salvation is made available to you, not because of your works. You know you have been saved by grace, the Bible says, through faith, so that you don't boast. You have been saved because Jesus has had mercy on you. So his grace has brought you in. And your part was just to only believe that the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus receives a pardon. Isn't that the story of every person that is born again? That the day you said yes to Jesus, that day everything was made new. Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, if any man be in Christ, a witch doctor, a person who is kind, a promiscuous person, a drunkard, if any man, anyone, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new being. That the moment I say yes to Jesus, I am in Christ and he is in me. Colossians chapter 3 talks about that now because your lives are hid with Christ in God. That your lives, because you have come to him, your lives are now hid with Christ in God. He is in you and you are in him. That's correct. So he's speaking and he's saying that you know the truth. The moment you have said yes to Jesus, he has come to take up residence inside of your heart. And the moment he takes up residence, the Bible says if anyone be in Christ, he is a new being. That very moment, that's the power of faith. 
Hallelujah. So if you say yes to Jesus, you'll walk around, but the world is not able to understand that. But you and I that are believers, we understand that because of faith, Jesus is able to cleanse the vilest offender. He says, come, let us reason together in the book of um, Isaiah chapter 1, that even though your sins are red as crimson, I shall make you as white as snow, just in comparison. The moment that you actually believe and receive, that very moment, all things are made new. What a blessed hope we have in Jesus. What a sure assurance well, we have in Jesus. Hallelujah. That that very moment you say yes to him, everything is different. And that means you act different. Because of faith. That the moment you have said yes to Jesus, you stop doing things differently. Or you start doing things differently, rather. You start to dress a certain kind of way. Why I'm saying that is because when I gave my life to Jesus Christ in high school, I was in Form 1. I didn't know much, yeah? But um, I went through a discipleship class, much like the one we have here. Only the discipleship class here is 10 classes. In high school, because you're together for, a lo- uh, for three terms, for a long time, three months, three months, three months, or just slightly more, give or take, the, the follow-up is never-ending. You continue to be discipled. You know the discipleship is over when you're given somebody to disciple. That might come in your first year or in your last year in Form 4, you know. You just continue being discipled. But during the discipleship, they would tell us, kama mimi niliokoka usiku, ilikoka our weekend challenge, 17th of March. Iyo usiku, around 9, 9.30 in the evening, um, nilikuwa nimekuja weekend challenge, nikiwa, nime antak, niko tu sawasi, ni jioni, tumekuja tu, kuji enjoy kwa upea, opa mungu, anilafu nika okoka. So the person that took my hand to walk with me this journey of salvation, told me, usirudi kukuja kanisa hivyo ukika mkora, taki niyo mashati yako, na simama kuna, you should look presentable when you come to the assembly of God. I'm just trying to explain that because of faith, you have been made different and you start to act different. Because you believe you're a different person. Hallelujah. Some places you used to frequent, you no longer go there. I remember when I was and I joined, when we joined the, the ministry team in the express service a couple of years back when the bishop invited us. And some of the orientation that we were given was that there are places you can no longer park your car. Because people see you coming here before COVID. Do you remember those good days when you used to come here under green prayer? Oh, may the Lord take us back to that. Beautiful times. We really look forward to those times. Anyway, people have come and they have prayed here with you. They know you are a pastor. Why do you a pastor? But you know you are a pastor. Sasa wakitoka hivi wanapata gari yako imepakiwa huko pale nje ya Karuma ndo pale. Na wanashindwa ala. Al. <clears throat> na wewe uko umeenda huko? Ulikuwa umeenda hiyo chemistry kwa kando. <laughs> so just because you're careful about such things, you act different. You have been made different, you act different. What has made you do all these changes? Faith. You believe by faith that you have been saved. Not because of your works. The Galatians had understood that. They came into the saving faith. But now, the saving grace of Jesus Christ. But now they are starting to move away from that. They are going into a different thing. They are going back to that system, old system of the law. Now maybe you are asking, how did the law used to work? This is how it used to work. The people who are outside that were Gentiles and had been brought in because of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus died once for all, for every person. Even the Gentiles and for the Jew alike. He died to invite. That's how you and I get to be part of this great promise. Because the door was opened so wide that everyone could come in. If you're seated there and you're not, you're thinking whether this is for you, I want to just answer your question. This is for you too. Please tell your neighbor this is for you too. Hallelujah. So the Gentiles back in the day, how, in the day of the law, they used to be told, the Gentile was told that he must come under the law of Moses or God would not bless him. The only way for God to bless them at that time was for them to come under the law of Moses. What did that mean? It meant that he must be circumcised according to the law of Moses. So the moment that the operation was done like this, the moment the cut was made, then they became blessed by God. The Holy Spirit was poured out to them. That's how it used to be back in the day. And that was sad because it meant everybody had to undergo that process that was not a very common thing. That was a thing for this selected Jewish people because they were under a certain law, a certain covenant. Then Jesus Christ comes and he says, all of us can come in. 
come right in. You're not saved because of your works or the things that you do. So you no longer need to do a special thing. You are not entreating God so that he can show you mercy. You don't need to buy a special broom that has been prayed for by the pastor so that you go to your house and sweep the devils away. You can go in by the authority that is found in the name of Jesus Christ and you don't have a fight or an argument. In that authority, in that name, you say, get out now in Jesus' name. You see, it's so easy. You don't have to be bound by things and laws and occasions and days that there are specific days to do certain things. No, we have been saved by faith, by grace through faith. Hallelujah. And that puts us all on the same ground because you need grace, I need grace, the person outside needs grace. There's nobody that does not need it. Hallelujah. So Paul is telling them, why are you guys going back to that? You know it doesn't work. You know, it's an old broken system of life. And is in that many of us here today, we know the things that do not work in this life, do we not? We have tried many things. We know they don't work. We have tried to save ourselves. We have tried, we have tried to say several um, chants in the morning. You wake up and you take a certain position and you try to, um, to harm in the morning so that you can get peace. But you know it doesn't work. And if it works, it is temporal at best. At the end of the day, by the time you're living like this, sin is crouching at your doorstep. It desires to have you. Your boss is waiting for you in the office. Where ham, Kabisa? Ham. Unampata pale. Iyo siku ndiyo ameamuka na mgu wa kushot kwa kwel. Ile nyo wanaita kwa kushoto. It's very stigmatizing for us left-handed people, by the way. Stop saying that. <laughs> you get to the office and your boss is waiting for you. Unashindua na vinye nime ham. Ama siku tumi ile sauti nini? So kesho unarudi pale. Ham, ham a lot, my friend. Ham a ham. Mm. You and I both know that it doesn't work. Because peace, true peace, is found in the Prince of Peace. And his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Joy, you try to get joy. Man, you try. You look for joy in a bottle. Unakunywa jamani, unakunywa pombe. Unakunywa. Unafika chini, unapata ipo. Ii chupa ni kama hakuweka joy. Unaeka kando, unachukua nyingine. Unakunywa, unapata chini, bada ujapata joy. Hii ni kama hakuweka, walisahau kwa na manufacturers, unaeka kando. You're done drinking at the end of that day. You're so happy, you're so, you're so excited. But because it is counterfeit, you get home and your wife is so frustrated. Your children are looking at you. They are like in such disgust. They are wondering, is there joy there? Because anything that is not found in Jesus is temporal at best. But you know that already because that's why you came to the faith. Paul seems to say to them in Galatians and to us, today, uh, to, to us again today, seems to say to us, you know it doesn't work. So why would you go back to it? It's like when he says, Give that old life a decent burial. Where? At the foot of the cross. When you come to Jesus, you come and you stand there, you say farewell to all those lonely nights, to all those moments that I stayed, stayed up and plotted by my own strength. It didn't work. It will never work. Farewell to that old do-it-yourself life. Now I want to do it with Jesus. And you give it a decent burial. And the Bible says he has not called you to a grave-tending life. A grave tender is the person who comes to angalia kama kuna nyasi, imemea hapo kwa hiyo grave, anakatakata, anaeka maua, anatengeneza. Anaenda two days later, anakuja, anangwangwa ile inaitua ria, unajua ria? Anangwangwa ria, anatengeneza hapo. Unajua that, that, that is a grave tender. Somebody who keeps to go, unaenda unapanguza, panguza, unawash, wash. You know, those, you, that is not the life God has called us into. God has called us into a life of freedom. The life that says upwards, onwards with Jesus. I'm not going and then coming back to this thing. The life I have been called to is a life of looking forward to Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. Hallelujah. That the day that I gave my life to Jesus, what I was doing according to what the Bible, how the Bible describes it, is it 2 Corinthians 10 from verse 4 I think, that the weapons of our warfare are not Canal. They are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. I love the message paraphrase. It says this, that using these God tools, these weapons of our warfare, we take every loose thought, every impulse, and every emotion, and we fit it into the structure of life that is shaped by Jesus Christ. 
In other words, we are walking around finding those loose thoughts in our minds that say you can still do it yourself. You can take it from the hands of Jesus and you can do it this time. God is taking too long. Go and take that issue you left in his hand. You can try and fast track it. That is a loose thought. What do you need to do? Go and take it. Bring it back down to the station for questioning. Who, who called you? Who, who, who is the person? Have you seen it in movies? When they're questioning people, the terrorists. That's the, who, who sent you? Who, who are you working for? That is what you should be doing with your thoughts. Your loose thoughts, at least. Your loose emotions and your loose impulses. Go and catch them, bring them down to the station of Jesus for questioning. Ask them, who are you working for? We are not giving you water or drink. We are not feeding you anymore until you say, who are you working for? And when you finally say it, we tell you, pack and go and never return. If you want to stay here in this head, rent-free, you must stay at the feet of Jesus. Our assignment is just that. To take it to the Lord in prayer and to leave it with the Lord in prayer. You've not been called to. Our problem must be that we take it to the Lord in prayer by faith. And then when we are leaving, we live with it. But God has called you to a life of faith. Therefore, what is this faith? Hebrews chapter um, 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the evidence of things hoped for. It is the conviction of things not seen. That is what faith is. The substance of the things that we hope for. The evidence of the things that we do not see. It says, by it the worlds were formed. Much later on, the elders obtained a good testimony. Verse 3 says, By it the worlds were framed, so that the things which are seen were made of things which are not seen. Hallelujah. That is the faith and the belief that we have. It says that the elders, the men of old, the patriarchs and matriarchs of the faith, they were commended because of it. They believed God. It was counted even to them as righteousness like Abraham. And then it says, By it the worlds were framed. God modeled it. When God said, let there be, he did not go and then come back again to check, was there, did it happen? He said it and moved right along. The example again that is modeled by Jesus when he's walking around on the earth with the disciples and they see a fig tree that is in full bloom doing false advertising, saying it has fruit and it didn't have any fruit. So comes to eat and he's looking for fruit. The Bible actually records that Jesus was hungry, needed something to eat. Came and found that there was nothing. And he said, nobody shall eat from you again. The Bible says the disciples had it. The next day, Jesus did not wake up before the disciples to go back that route to check, did it happen? So that they do not know that, think I am a liar. No, he said it and it was good as done. When the disciples passed that route again the next day, as they were passing through, one of them is the one that called it to the attention of Jesus. said, Lord, this is the tree that you said nobody shall eat from it. It had begun to wither. Because he modeled it, the world was formed by such words of finality, because that is what faith is, finality. I take it to the Lord, and I know that if it is in the Lord's hand, it is good as done. In fact, it is done. Hallelujah. And I'm not carrying it away. I take it to the Lord in prayer and I leave it with the Lord in prayer. That is what faith is. We have been called to a life of trusting, to a life of believing. And the Bible actually further puts it like this, giving the example of Enoch who was called up and did not see death. It says that he pleased God before he was taken. He had this testimony. People would say of him that this man pleases God. Hebrews chapter 11, I think verse 6, that he pleased God. That was the testimony. That before he was taken, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. And then continues to say, for without faith, it is impossible. It is not difficult. It is not just, you know, sometimes, some days there, come see, come sir. (laughs) No, it says without faith, it is, come on, say it with me, without faith, it is, impossible to please God. You could try, but I want to tell you the Bible has already given you the answer. It is not possible. Hallelujah. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Then it says, because everyone that has faith must believe that God exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hallelujah. He is a rewarder of those people who seek him over and over again. And God has not started now. He has not started to just now in 2021 seek for people who, to reward people who diligently seek him. Who people who, people who trust him. 
Hallelujah. Hajanza Sasa, he's been doing it for a long time. He's been doing it since the beginning. Everybody that, listen guys, everybody that trusted God never went away in tears. Everybody, the Bible says, he who comes to him bearing precious seed shall doubtless go back rejoicing. If you are coming to the Lord, if you are coming to him in prayer, you are bringing to him the seed of your faith. You are bringing to him and telling him, Lord Jesus, I am bringing this thing into your hands. I know you are able. You will do it. Someday soon you will get to me. You shall doubtless come forth rejoicing. Because everyone that calls on the name of the Lord, the Bible says, shall be saved. And no one that called on the name of Jesus was ever put to shame. Not even one. I would challenge one person to show me even one. I don't know all the seven billion people in the earth right now or the people who existed in the earth before me and the people who will come after me, but I would actually be willing to put everything on the line and say, I would dare anyone to show me someone who trusted in Jesus and fell short and was put to shame. You might say, oh, what about the people who believed in Jesus up to their deathbed, trusting that they would be healed and then they died. Those people did not die, they did not lose, they will live again. Hallelujah. Those people that trusted in Jesus to the end, they have been taken up to glory together with him. All that is left is us waiting for that final beautiful morning when we shall meet up with them on Hallelujah Square. Hallelujah. Buana Yesu asifiwe. Nobody that trusted in Jesus, you're saying, oh, what about that person who waited on God for one, two, three, one, two, three, and even to the time that they were dying, they had not seen the fulfillment. Have you read the book of Hebrews and seen that all these patriarchs and matriarchs of faith, all these people that trusted in God, they did not receive the thing for which they promised, but their faith kept them to the very end. It is a beautiful end for the person that trusts in God. It is a beautiful end. Keep trusting. Tell your neighbor, keep trusting. Oh, you must faith it to the end. You must keep your faith in Jesus to the end. You must keep your faith anchored in the beginner and the finisher of our faith in Jesus Christ. I'm saying God has not started to look for faith in the earth right now. He has been doing it from the beginning. And we have many good examples of people who trusted God and were not put to shame. And we have many other examples, sad examples of people who refused to trust God and their end was destruction. It shall not be our portion in Jesus' name. We shall be of those who keep going. Our faith shall be built over and over again until we have seen God in our situations. Hallelujah. Allow me to finish by giving the example of a certain king of Judah in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 16. 2 Chronicles chapter 16, it's long. We are not going to read all of it. It's from verse 1 to verse 14. It's, it's not very long, actually. You could read it in one sitting. It's a very interesting story. King Asa of Judah, just to give a little bit of background, was one of those kings who actually did well in the sight of the Lord for most of their lives. All right? They served the Lord. They did good things. They went and took what was taken as plunder from out there, from their enemies, brought them back into the temple of the Lord. They served the Lord. They did good things. They were good reformists. They were developmental. They were people who were, you know, he was a good king. But in his end was destruction. Why was his end destruction? Has to do with the foolishness that we are talking about. People who can think, but they fail to use their power of perception. People who know the truth, but refuse to apply it. Oh, may that not be our portion in Jesus' name. May God help us to apply the truth that we know, especially about him. Amen. So the Bible says about King Asa of Judah, it says, In the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah, that he might let none go out or come in to King Asa of Judah. Then... Asa brought silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the king's house and sent to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus, saying, Let us make a treaty between you and me, and as there was between my father and your father. See, I have sent you silver and gold. Come break your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so that he will be withdraw from me. Because we're not going to read the whole of it, I just want to give you a quick, um, is it called synopsis? It has to be synopsis. The other word in my head is eulogy. So is it synopsis? <laughs> I think it's synopsis. A quick uh, overview of the story. So there are three people. There is uh, King uh, Basha of Israel. There is King Asa or Asa of Judah. And then there is another king called, I think, is it Ben-Hadad? 
of Syria. All right, so we'll call him King Ben, okay? So there's King Ben, King Asa, and King Basha. All right, so um, King Asa is our main character of this story. He's a, he was a good king for most part of his reign until this time. Okay, what is wrong with him this time? So there's this king of Israel called Basha that is, has actually set up, he's building something or the city called Ramah and Ramah is in the way of going to Judah. So when he builds that city and fortifies it, nobody will be able to come in to Asa's territory of Judah. Nobody will be able to go out. So in that way, he's crippling this kingdom and its economy. Come and say, say, say. All right. So after that, what happens is that he realizes, I can't stand alone, just like most of those other kings could not stand alone. So that king Basha could do these great things. He needed the help of another king, the other king called Ben of Syria. All right. So he goes, King Asa goes and talks to this other king of Syria, tells him, let us make a treaty. Let us, like the ones our father had, let us make a treaty so that um, this guy can leave me alone. And they actually agree. Now, one of the things that King Asa does is that he, does, he goes into the house of the Lord, the temple, and takes the treasures of gold and silver and comes and gives them to this guy as a bribe. Mistake number one. You, if he took things from his house and things from the Lord's house. Now, Spurgeon actually says that it doesn't matter. He's not, he, doesn't, he wouldn't care about the things he took from his house. But the things he took from the Lord's house, he was putting the Lord at, at, at loss. He was robbing the Lord so that he might find favor with the arm of flesh. Imagine that. We are taking the things that the Lord has given to us that are supposed to be in, in his royal service, and then we are taking them out to other people. What does that mean for you and for me today? It is taking the things that the Lord has given to you, your gift mix, your skill set, your talent, your, everything about you, your ability to think and make money and make wealth. You're taking those things that should be used in the royal service of the Lord or to make the kingdom better and expand, and you're taking them to gain favor with men. In other words, you're using them for other people's destruction. Umwaya na watu sharp. Najwa watu sharp. Thinkers. Those people who yani, you just give them a key solution, key, a key situation, and they give you a solution, and it's a good solution. Those are the people Pastor Kibera was telling us the other day that you actually, wakiwa shule, principal anaona huyu atanichomea shule. So anamchukua anamfanya kwe school captain. Because when he's on the, other, on the side of the administration, they are safe. Because he has intelligent skills to be able to catch those people who are plotting evil. Because he's like them. He knows where he can get the people. Anajua mtu akipanga hivi watu wanafikiria atapangia nyuma ya madom kwa sababu huko ndio walimu waendangi. So walimu atakuwa anashinda huko lakini anapangia kwa dom kwa room yake ndani. So huko ndio mnamkuta. Eh? If you wondering whether I used to be those people. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, using your own gift mix and skill set that the Lord has given to you, instead of using it in God's royal service, you're using it outside to bring distraction. Ukona hivi business argument. Badala utengeneze biashara na vitu zingine. Jamani, unaenda unasaidia, unafund, wewe unakuwa ule mwenye unafund, you're funding. Umejitengenezea kako ka NGO kadogo, you're funding wale wa mama uko ushago, wenye wanatengenezea watu changa, waze wa watu waishe macho kabisa. Yani, unasema, miss you, zangi changa, mimi. Lakini wewe ni funder. Wewe wanaitawa nini? Oh, in sponsor. <laughs> Where in your sponsor? You're sponsoring that work. Uku Nairobi atuwezi tukajua, juu vinyo unakuwa menyonga tayi kama mimi. Lakini tukijua zile vitu unafanyaka uko shango. <laughs> oh, if you're here and you're that person, you're in the right place. There's freedom and salvation in this house in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me try and finish. So anyway, king, this king Asa goes and does the wrong thing. He goes and takes these things that belong to the Lord and gives them. Mistake number one. Mistake number two is that he refused to trust that the Lord would help him. Now, if you go on later to, from verse 7, the Lord sends um, the prophet called Hanani, Hanani the seer. The Lord sends Hanani the seer to him and says to him, because you have relied on the king of Syria called Ben and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Were the Ethiopians and the Lubim or the Libyans not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet, because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. What Hanani is talking about was that there is a time that this king, was, this same king Asa or Asa, was faced 
with a difficult situation. He was up against the Ethiopians, up against the Libyans. The, dif- the thing about them is that they had much greater armies than this one that he was facing of King Basha of Israel. They were a more, a, a more imminent threat, but he trusted in the Lord at that time when he was doing good, and the Lord delivered him. So now the, 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 the prophet is asking him, Weren't those guys greater and stronger than these ones right now? Yet you trusted God then and now you're not willing to trust God with this other small challenge? In other words, he's telling him, in the next verse he actually says, In this you have done foolishly. Why? For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of whose heart is loyal to him. In other words, on whose heart trusts him. In other words, on whose heart has faith in him. The eyes of the Lord, if you could leave that there for just a minute. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Imagine that beautiful image that the eyes of the Lord are running around. Even right now, they are running around. I think that's present simple tense to say run. The, the, the eyes of the Lord run around. That's what they do. Like the sun rises in the east, sets in the west. That's a norm. Okay. So the eyes of the Lord run to and fro. This means it doesn't take a light view. The eyes of the Lord search narrowly into the course of things. F.B. Meyer says, in all of the wide, whole wide earth, there is not one spot that is so lonely, one heart that is so darkened as to escape those eyes of the Lord. They are always going around. But this man refused to trust that the Lord can handle his situation. This is how I see it. That the eyes of the Lord are looking around, and when, it sees a heart, when they see a heart that is willing to trust him, they catch his attention. What would the Lord find as he is doing the thing right now, the survey? Is he finding hearts that are trusting him in Zimaman right now? Is he finding hearts that are waiting on him? Or is he finding hearts that are ready to make up plans? Right now you're already thinking, hmm, nimetoka 2020, kulikuwa kumekauka hii mwaka siwezi nikakaukiwa tena. Watajua. Umepanga zile mabiashara utafanya haujali ni nani zitaumiza? umetengeneza umepika pesa kwako nyumbani unajua ile pesa ya kufuliwa ya laundry wash wash hiyo unaifulia pesa kwako nyumbani unasema watajua mm. you're thinking about all these things you're trusting god for a relationship or for getting into marriage and you trusted god once and then that um, you know maybe didn't work out and now you're like <laughs> mimi tena <laughs> mtajua sasa huko nje wanakuona hawakuoni uko naye leo kesho haunae kwa kweli ah. and the question the lord would ask us today is oh foolish foolish believer have you forgotten that i took you through then and i'm able to take you through now have you forgotten that if you trust me i will always come through Have you forgotten, O oh foolish believer, that the arm of flesh will always fail you? Have you forgotten? It's as if the Lord would stand in this place and say to us, like he said to the Galatians, O oh foolish Galatians, O oh foolish believer, have you so quickly forgotten that the eyes of the Lord are always running to and fro, seeking those who trust him so that he might strengthen them? Are you so foolish as to remove yourself from the list of the people that the Lord would find to strengthen this morning? Why would you do that? Oh, may the Lord cause us to have faith to the end in the name of Jesus. You're here because you trusted God. You trusted God. Hidi ufike hapa umemtrust. Amekuvukisha hiyo mwaka tumetoka na hata sasa hivi amekuleta hadi hapa. You have trusted. Maybe you're here saying, "Oh, but you know, nilifutwa kazi, my neighbors are laughing at me because I'm a believer. They have had to feed me." It's because you're refusing to open your eyes and see like God. God has decided to feed you even through unbelievers. You're saying, "Oh, but it's so shameful, it's so shameful." But God is harvesting glory out of that. Will you trust the Lord one more time? Here's a joke. When King Asa was given that, that example, when he was given that warning by the prophet, he took the prophet and locked him up. Alimfungia jela. Na akaendelea kutesa watu na kuamini nguvu zake. Do you know how King Asa died? It's found in the last verse, I think verse 13 of that same story. He died of a foot disease. Foot disease for crying out loud. 
died of a foot disease. A whole king with a great army died of a foot disease. And the Bible says one more time, yet in his disease he did not seek the Lord, but trusted the physicians. Even after receiving the warning. The Lord is here telling you, trust me, trust me, trust me. I can handle your son and your daughter. I can handle your marriage. I can handle your relationships. Leave those portions alone. Leave them alone. Trust me, I can change the heart of your spouse. Trust me, I can bring order to this nation. Trust me, just trust me. I can give you better income than you've ever thought about. I can take care of your situation. Trust me, just trust me. I pray that you will refuse to deal as foolishly as the Galatians or as foolishly as King Asa in that you ignore the word of the Lord as it comes to us today, this morning, that we will refuse together. We will say, no, Lord Jesus, as you're looking around, you will find faith in my heart. Don't you just take a minute right now if you can bow your head and open up your mouth. You know, you know what you're dealing with right now. I might not know. I know what I'm dealing with right now as the word of the Lord is coming to me today. Won't you just make a fresh commitment and say to him, Lord Jesus, I am willing. Lord Jesus, I am ready. Lord Jesus, I want it one more time. Lord Jesus, I want you one more time. I want to trust you. The arm of flesh will fail us. Your word says as much in Jeremiah says that cast is the man who trusts in the hand of another man, in the hand of flesh. Oh Lord Jesus, I don't want to be cast. I want to be blessed and I cannot be blessed outside of faith and trust and belief in you. Come on one more minute. Just open up your mouth. Open up your mouth and make that prayer. If you're here, you're a believer. The call that God is giving to you and to me today is that you would watch what is in your heart. That you would watch it. That you would refuse that other things take over the affection of your heart. That your heart would just be inclined to God and his word in the name of Jesus. That your heart would be inclined only to the fact that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly, measurably more than we can, I think, ask or even imagine. And that we will trust him afresh. If you're here, you're not a believer. Consider this morning that the Lord stands at the door and says, Come to me, all you who labor, and I will give you rest. But Jesus, ever the gentleman, will not budge in. He will stand at the door and wait for you to say yes. Imagine the king of all royalty standing at the door and waiting and hoping that today would be the day you say yes. If that is you, if you just make this prayer after me, saying you want to give your life to Jesus, saying yes to the king of kings one time and say, God, I want to start saying yes to you today. And I will say yes to you all the days of my life. Lord Jesus, I thank you for loving me. I am a sinner, but you are the Savior. Today I open up my spirit that you would come into my heart. Make me brand new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit to lead, guide, and direct me. To keep me trusting and believing in you all the days of my life. From today, I am saved. I believe you and trust you completely. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord keep us trusting at his feet every day of our lives to the praise and to the glory of his dear name. May he strengthen you to wait on him because he is faithful to be trusted. God bless you.